starting now. All right, so uh, so let me open uh, this uh, web series of uh, webinar. Uh, so I'm Mark Ivaldi, the president, actual president of uh, the International Transportation Economics Association. I would say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, given that uh, there are people from uh, from. Uh, from the uh, west coast of uh, the U.S. and uh, from people from uh, also uh, on the on the west coast of uh, uh, of China. So, um, uh, well, given the, the the outbreak, we we have been uh, we could not organize uh, the annual uh, conference. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, the, the the conference should have been in uh, in Beijing, and for, uh, unfortunately, uh, was uh, we could not do it, and uh, so finally we have decided to uh, to organize uh, this uh, this four uh, webinar session. So maybe Leo will have uh, time to pre to present them. We have made a selection of uh, of paper out of uh, the one that have been submitted to the to the Beijing event. Uh, I think uh, we did that because the, I think it's very important. We thought that it, it is very important uh, for uh, our community uh, to show that our community of uh, uh, transport economics is alive and is very productive. And as you will see, uh, I think that uh, the papers that are going to be uh, presented are, are, are very interesting uh, uh, papers. Uh, so. Um, and uh, if the if the uh, pandemic situation uh, continue, uh, IT will uh, will take other initiatives so, so that uh, uh, you could uh, uh, share uh, your most uh, recent uh, recent research. Uh, so I, I will not speak too much uh, given the the timing uh, and uh, ju just one thing uh, as president is is normal to. To recall you that you have, uh, please uh, renew your membership to IT or, or join uh, IT. It is uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, I hope uh, the only thing I can say is I hope to see you in person uh, next year. It will be in Rome. And, uh, uh, and uh, in two years, you will be uh, in, in Beijing uh, because we have moved uh, the, uh, this opportunity, the, 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 uh, the, this case, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, our Chinese colleague and Yakan uh, uh, has uh, offered to, to organize it uh, again in, uh, in, in 2020, uh, 2022 which will be in the same time as the Winter Olympic game in, in China. So uh, just uh, wish you that uh, good health and uh, I wish you uh, that you will enjoy the, this, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, we are already almost uh, 100 uh, connected, which is uh, already uh, quite, uh, quite good. And uh, I will uh, give the floor to uh, uh, to Ricardo, who is going to chair the, the session. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you to, to all the attendants to these webinars. It's my pleasure to, to be here to chair this, this session. We have four speakers, and uh, the idea is the following. Every speaker is gonna share his screen with the rest of, the, of, of us. Okay, so the speaker is going to manage the, the 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 pace of the of the presentation, and uh, then uh, they are going to have twenty minutes to present their their papers, and then there will be ten minutes for questions or general comments or even a short discussion if possible. Okay, so the way it works is the following: you have to in, in, in the the people in the audience who have eventually questions. Uh, you have to write down the questions in the chat of the of the Zoom application that is going to be on the right hand side of your screens. Okay, so you have to write down your questions. You cannot interrupt the presenters while they are presenting. Okay, and at the end uh, we'll see if we have time to some uh, interaction. But in principle, you have to write down the your your questions in the chat. 
then I will collect them and I will propose them to the speakers at the end of their presentation. Okay, so that's the, the way we're gonna do it. And uh, I mean, we chose this 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 way of, of proceeding just to 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 be sure that we that we don't uh, waste many time, so that we can really stick to the to the schedule that, that we have uh, set up. Okay, so that's all from my side. Thank you again for being there. Uh, good health to to everyone, and I, and then I will give the word to our to our first speaker, which is Guillaume Pomé from Paris School of Economics. And the title of the paper he's presenting is "How to Regulate Modern Airports." Okay, so Guillaume, the floor is yours. Uh, from now, you have 20 minutes, so try to stick to your time, and that's it. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So let me just share my screen one second. Is that good? Can you see it? Yes. 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 Okay. So I'll start. Thanks. Uh, so first, thanks for having me in this uh, particular condition. Thanks for to Mark, Leonardo, Ricardo, uh, the IT team for the organization. Uh, I guess it's not easy to uh, organize this. So I'm very grateful that uh, we can still present things. So I'm going to present you uh, a theoretical paper uh, about uh, regulating airports, uh, which is joint work with David Martimor and uh, Jérôme Pouillet. So let me directly introduce what we have in mind, what we call uh, modern airports. So uh, nowadays airports are more and more privately owned or managed. Uh, so as economists, we generally fear that they may abuse uh, market power. Uh, so that's why we think that we need to regulate them. But on top of that, there are some uh, specificities of airports that make it difficult uh, to regulate them. So first, uh, airports are multi-product entities. So on the one end, they provide uh, aeronautical activities. So this is just the, the, their core business. Uh, they say uh, flights, tickets to passengers. But on the other end, they also provide uh, more and more nowadays uh, commercial services inside the airport, uh, such as uh, food, uh, car parking, and other uh, non-related act activities, non-related to aeronautical activities. So this means that airports have multiple sources of revenues, and also that there is some kind of uh, demand complementarity between uh, those different activities that we need to take into account. And third, uh, airports also need to incur large uh, infrastructure investments to build terminals, runways, and so on. And this affects consumer demand, this affects congestions, and also this affects profits. Uh, so this is a, high, a large concern for the regulator as well. And finally, uh, airports generally deal with airlines, and uh, we think that this is in a vertical relationship way, and this may also affect the way uh, you have to regulate uh, airports. You have to take into account the airline sign as well. So this is how I'm going to present you uh, this uh, paper. I'm going to introduce the model uh, and how do we model this different feature. Then I will talk about uh, optimal regulation and the main lessons that we can learn from them. Uh, then I will present you how to implement this optimal regulation, and I will talk about uh, traditional regulations such as price cap regulation, rate of return, or talk a little bit about the debate between single till versus dual till uh, regime. And if I have time, I will also uh, go deeper in the airport airline relationship, how does it affect regulation, and the case in which investments are non-observable. So let's directly dive into the, the model. So here we, we stick to a very simple theoretical model. We are going just to assume that there is one airport and one airline. And for now, let's, let's say that they are vertically integrated. So that's, they are the same entity. On the consumer side, uh, consumers can buy uh, aeronautical services at price P. So they can just buy a ticket and fly and then they become passengers. 
And if and only if they become passengers, then they can also uh, buy commercial services at price P0. So they can consume food, they can rent some uh, car parking, uh, be in a particular space in the airport to be uh, comfortable and so on. And we, also, we are going also to assume that the airport is responsible for investments decision. And this, this investment decision are going to be called E. And those are going to positively affect the uh, demand for uh, aeronautical services. I will be more precise on how we model this, uh, uh, the impact of investments in a, in a minute. So to be more precise on the consumer side, you have a continuum of consumers who have valuation for different activities. So V is going to be the valuation for uh, aeronautical activities and V0 is going to be uh, the valuation for commercial services. Uh, notice that the, the commutative distribution function for V also depends on E. So in the next slides, I will explain exactly how we model the relationship between aeronautical services and investments. So this gives rise to the indirect utility of consumers. And we model this in a very particular way. That is, you can see from uh, the slides that if I consume as a consumer aeronautical services, then I can get V minus P. So just the valuation minus the price of aeronautical services if I decide to fly. And if I fly, and if only if I fly, I can enjoy the, the, uh, the V0 minus P0, the surplus from consumption of commercial services. That is, if, when I decide whether or not to go to the airport, I only take into account the, the, the difference between the valuation for medical services and the, the, the price. I do not take into account uh, commercial services at all. So it means that if initially I don't want to fly, it's not because the airport is offering some cheap car parking or very good food that I will ultimately decide to fly. So the, the, the commercial activist cannot compensate, the, the surplus in the commercial activist cannot compensate for the surplus that I derive on the aeronautical services. And if we model demand that way, then the demand for aeronautical services is going to be one minus F of P and E. And the demand for commercial services is going to be one minus F times one minus G. That is, the demand for commercial services is directly conditional open consumption of aeronautical services, but not, the reverse is not true. So now what about investments? So investments again cost E to the airport. And we have in mind that investments favors the demand for aeronautical services. Uh, this can be because of an increase in capacity, you build uh, an additional terminal, you build more runways, you offer more choice to the consumer, uh, a, lot, a better service quality. So how does the investment affect uh, the consumer? It's simply, we're simply going to assume that uh, if you have a larger amount of, it, of investments, then um, valuations for medical services are going to be more likely to be higher. So in the first order stochastically uh, dominate sets. So if you invest more, you are more likely to have consumers with higher valuation. So this is the way we model uh, the uh, impact of investments on uh, the airport uh, services. So obviously investments directly affect uh, the demand for aeronautical services, but it also ultimately indirectly affects the demand for commercial services. Because if there are more consumers uh, that would like to be passengers, then you have more passengers and then you have uh, more people also consuming uh, what's inside, what the other offers inside the airport. Okay, <clears throat> so what's the, uh, given this demand uh, and investment setting, what is the optimal regulation? So we are just simply going to assume that the air regulator can jointly control uh, both prices and the level of investments at the airport. And what the uh, regulator does, it simply maximizes social welfare, which is the sum of the consumer surplus, CS, uh, the profits of the uh, airline and airport as a, as a vertical integrated entity, which is PR. And <clears throat> this minus one, mal, uh, one plus uh, lambda T is simply going to be the cost of subsidizing the airport. So T is going to be 
the amount of public subsidy that the airport is giving to the, uh, to the airport. And lambda is just the cost of public fund. This is how much it costs for the regulator to spend one euros of subsidy, which is a pretty standard way of modeling those problems. And so the regulator maximizes the social surplus subject to the uh, condition that the airport at least, at least breaks even. Uh, so just to be a little bit more uh, precise, if you look at the profit of the airport and the airline as an entity, uh, you see that you have both profits from commercial activities and aeronautical services. Uh, the minus E is how much it costs to the airport to invest. And the plus T is how much the airport receives in terms of public subsidy. And C and C0 are marginal costs of production for aeronautical services and uh, commercial services that we assume to be uh, constant here. <clears throat> so we, and also, sorry, we assume implicitly that this is a single tier regime. That is, all the profits of the airports uh, are taken into account to cover the, uh, the, uh, the cost of uh, investment. So once you have that, and then to solve the problem, uh, you obtain, and I'm not going to enter very much into details here, but you obtain, non-surprisingly, uh, Ramsey Boiter pricing. Uh, that is, the, here the prices, they depend both on the cost of public funds, and they are also inversely related to the price elasticity of aeronautical services and commercial services. So what's important here to notice is that the, the, the point for the commercial services is to look at the cost that we take into account is the social marginal cost. And the social marginal cost not only take into account the marginal cost of production, but it also takes into account the fact that when you, uh, when you uh, let more consumer become passenger, you also increase the revenue on you know, commercial uh, activity side. And also this increase the consumer surplus. So that's why the social marginal cost is uh, divided into three parts. So what are the main lessons of this optimal regulation? So on the aeronautical service side, uh, you can see from the previous side, sorry, uh, uh, you, you can see that in, in that slide, the uh, optimal price for aeronautical services is strictly above the social marginal cost of those services. And so this stems directly from the fact that giving a subsidy to the airport is costly for the regulator. That is, we may let the airport make positive profits or maybe not too negative profits because it's costly to subsidy the airport so that it breaks even. So we price strictly above social marginal costs. What we can also um, see is that sometimes when, for instance, the demand for aeronautical services is very elastic, uh, the price is very elastic, or if the revenues derived from uh, commercial services are quite important, it is even possible that the optimal regulation entails that the uh, airport makes uh, strictly negative profits uh, without a subsidy. So even if the cost of public funds is positive, even if it's costly to subsidize the airport, it might be optimal to set the price of the airport even below the, the private cost, let it make the, uh, negative profits and offer a subsidy. So those are the main uh, ideas here. You have to balance between the cost of public funds and the fact that you would like to diminish the price of aeronautical services uh, to increase consumer surplus, but also because you attract more consumers uh, of commercial services that way. Uh, what, we, what we can learn on commercial services side is that if this side is not regulated, then the airport is going to set the monopoly price on that side. So even if you regulate aeronautical services, with our model, you find that commercial services are ultimately going to be chosen to be the monopoly price by the airport because consumers are captive once they enter the airport. So this goes uh, highly in favor of um, not only regulated the, the, uh, the price of aeronautical services, but also regulating the price of commercial services. Uh, this, this is even more uh, important when you look at investments. Uh, I do not provide the details here, but the optimal level of investments also depends on both prices, directly for aeronautical services and indirectly for commercial services. 
So ultimately, if you want to regulate investments well, you cannot do that just by regulating the price of heretical services. You have to regulate both prices. Okay, so that's about the main feature of the uh, optimal regulation. Now, uh, how can we actually implement this optimal regulation? And for that, uh, we'll just look into the, one of the most common way of doing that. It's a price cap regulation. And for that, what we propose is a global price cap formula where the regulator sets a global price cap, which is this P over line, and also some weights, alpha and alpha zero. And then the airport freely chooses uh, the price of those two services freely, as long as they satisfy the constraint. So this is usually what's, what's been done. It's a little bit more complicated in, uh, in practice. But what we find here you know, with this model is that if you don't regulate uh, investments uh, along with the regulation, along with the price cap regulation, then not only you have an inefficient level of investments, but also you have inefficient price for aeronautical services and commercial services. So if you just implement a price cap regulation, not only you fail in providing the optimal level of investment, but you, only, you also fail in uh, providing the correct uh, prices for aeronautical and commercial services. Uh, and this is because the airport does not fully internalize the consumer surplus uh, and the price cap regulation is not enough to, 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 to make the airport fully internalize those uh, additional uh, surplus. Um, and then it's, this is even worse. If only the price of aerial services are regulated, uh, which is generally the case in practice, uh, this is even worse. That is, you don't achieve an efficient, efficient level of investments and price at all. So what can we do to uh, actually uh, solve this problem? Uh, I'm going to go very quickly on, on this. Uh, there is a common, less common now uh, regulation, which is the rate of return regulation. Uh, but it is well known that it's generally prone to uh, overinvestment. And in our case, it's also the case. So we just get rid of this rate of return regulation. Uh, and instead, what we do is that we uh, propose. Uh, Sorry to interrupt, Guillaume, just a nice yes. rem reminder that you should control your time. Okay? Yes. So uh, you have uh, for about four minutes or so. Okay? Yes, I have a timer. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so what we have is a subsidy penalty regulation. And so we have that the global price cap regulation must be supplemented by this subsidy penalty regulation. And this is actually a very simple regulation. It's just that, uh, look at this formula with the S. Uh, it's simply that when the airport invests less than the optimal level of, uh, of, of uh, the choose less than the optimal level of investment, then we offer uh, the airport a subsidy. When the airport uh, invests more, then this becomes a penalty. And this marginal subsidy is chosen to be uh, exactly equal to the, 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 the surplus that the airport doesn't internalize. So when we, you do that, when you supplement the price cap regulation with this particular uh, regulation on investment levels, then you can actually achieve the optimal regulation. If you just remove one of them, then you fail to implement the optimal regression at all on both sides, prices and level of investments. Um, and also, interestingly, from this uh, optimal regulation and implementation problem, uh, we are able to address the single till with this dual till uh, regulation problem. That is whether you should uh, use uh, all the profits of the airports to cover the cost of investments or uh, if you uh, have to allocate shares of these investments to uh, different revenues. And the result here is that in our model, actually the optimal regulation is independent of whether you choose a single till or dual till regime, as long as the regulator can uh, himself choose how to allocate the burden of uh, investments. That is, here you, there is no, you can gain nothing by choosing one regime or the other. Um, and so this is because you control initially all prices and investments, then it doesn't matter whether you choose one regime. I mean, you can perfectly choose the regime that fits uh, the best. Uh, 
but none is providing you with uh, an advantage in the regulation. <clears throat> so uh, yes, I have less than two minutes. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you about uh, the specificity, specificity of the airport and an airline relationship. So if you assume that the airport and the airline are non-vertically integrated, uh, and instead that the airport is offering some price W to the airline, and then in turn, the airline freely sets the original price. Uh, in that case, the regulator does not have direct control on the price of aeronautical services and only, only has control on the price that the airport offers the airline. So the optimal regulation, uh, can we implement the optimal regulation as before? And very briefly, what we obtain here is that this highly depends on whether or not the airport can price discriminate uh, the airline. So in case the airport has access to two-part tariff, that is the, if the airport can also have, uh, also fix an access charge to the airline, that is some uh, constant amount of money that you have to pay regardless uh, of the amount that you consume, then the optimal regulation is unchanged and the regulator can implement it exactly as before. But if you forbid price discrimination, then the optimal regulation has to be changed and you have to increase the uh, price of aeronautical services. So the takeaway from this is that apparently you should not, it's not a good idea to forbid uh, price discrimination here because forbidding it generally create distortion in how much you can control the, what the airlines does. And then it ultimately uh, affects the design of the optimal regulation and it's become uh, worth. Uh, so let me just give you a little summary if, it's that, if that's okay with the time. Yes, you, you should conclude, uh, Guillaume. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Uh, so the big things here is that uh, if you want to implement uh, uh, correctly the optimal regulation, not only you need to use a global price cap regulation on both prices and not only on article prices, but you also have to supplement this with uh, some spe specific um, policy on investment. Uh, in that scenario, single till and dual till regime are actually equivalent uh, and they, you, you cannot gain uh, anything by choosing one or the other. And finally, for what I've, I've been telling you, uh, here forbidding price discrimination when the airport and the airline are not vertically integrated uh, seems to distort the optimal regulation. So maybe we have to think again about uh, what you should allow uh, in the practice between airports and airline. And I'm not talking about the last points that I did not cover here. Uh, yes, so I think I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Guillaume. Uh, thank you. You were, I mean, good on, on time. Okay, so. Uh, I think I can uh, collect the questions from the audience in like in three. Uh, big questions because actually they are uh, there is quite a lot of consensus on, on the questions so and and they mostly deal with with the assumptions of the model so the first one raised by mark ramon and carlos is uh, on the assumption on on airline airport uh, integration okay and uh, on, uh, um, um, mark was also uh, uh, um, asking uh, why you don't consider airports as two-sided platforms? Okay, so this is the, the first question about the integration and, 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 and the assumption. Why you are assuming this, and how can you justify that? Okay, sorry. You can answer if if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yes, but sorry, but I didn't uh, hear okay, the last part. Okay, on on airline airport integration that you are making at the beginning. Uh, and why you don't consider Airbus as two-sided platforms. So the, this, is the, the, this is the question. Okay, I, I'm gonna make the three questions and then you can answer because otherwise it's gonna yeah. be ineffective. Okay, the second one has to do with um, a question uh, raised by Tiziana, uh, is that uh, in, in a way you are assuming that, um, that consumers are, are fully myopic in the sense that, that the, the, the facilities uh, from retail are not uh, actually uh, conditioning their, their decisions, okay? So uh, this is the second question. And the third question uh, from Nicole has to do with uh, the fact that consumers, uh, they all buy in the terminals. 
So they are in a, in a sense they are trapped, right? So uh, these are the, the three questions uh, uh, that come from from the audience. So uh, if you can give some feedback, uh, fast feedback about these three groups of questions, it would be nice. Okay, perfect. Uh, so th thanks for the question. Uh, so uh, about the first one about two-sided platforms. So yes, obviously uh, this this is another way of considering uh, this modernization. So we haven't taken this route. Um, and I actually, uh, the route that we take is a little bit uh, more on the side that uh, airlines do, I mean, in two-sided platform, airlines do profit more on uh, the fact that there are more consumers and uh, the airport, could, uh, sorry, and, and the customer services could benefit from the fact that there are more airlines and so on. Uh, but here, with our assumption, what we would like to emphasize is actually the fact that uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, capture of the uh, airports within uh, of, of consumers on the commercial activity side. So yeah. this 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 is obviously different from a two-sided platform, but this is uh, probably investigating uh, another way of seeing uh, these commercial uh, uh, activities as being uh, maybe the most extreme form of uh, consumer being captive of the airport. Uh, so I, I do not say that this is the uh, ultimate way of doing this. And uh, maybe, uh, I mean, probably and two-sided ways are also valuable, uh, but this is, this is one take uh, among the others. So yeah, I guess that's the best answer that I can give for, for this question. Okay, so I don't know if... Uh, yes. Yeah. No, go ahead. If you have uh, anything to say about the, the other points. Uh, so about the consumers that are fully myopic. So I, I guess that the question is related to the fact that consumers do not uh, foresee that they are going to be uh, uh, exploited by the, uh, the airport as, uh, as they, they, they are. This is a, uh, sorry, the fact once they the enter the airport. That the retail business does not stimulate their demand. So that's the point, I guess. Uh, yes. Uh, so actually, so this is the, the, the way we model this, uh, and, and I think that, okay, so this is a bit extreme because we assume that they, this, this absolutely does not uh, affect consumers. Uh, so it, probably it affects uh, some consumers, probably uh, people who travel for business are much more affected by this. Exactly. Um, but the idea it was to uh, make this very extreme and uh, here, uh, form of saying that uh, you are not going to enter the airport uh, if you have a lower valuation for hydrocar services that the price is, and this cannot be compensated because you have an incredible, uh, uh, you have incredible restaurants or car parking inside the airport. So obviously we could uh, relax this by saying that maybe uh, there are some consumers that, uh, that can be interested by uh, the, two of the, the two sides. Uh, but I guess that this will just uh, reduce a little bit the effect that we have that the, mon the, mon the, the airport would set the monopoly price uh, in case uh, where it's unregulated. So if I, I, I guess that we probably can uh, add some parameter here and see what happens, but it's just going to affect the results marginally the airport is just going to have less market power on consumers uh, in the end. It's not going to change uh, the qualitative results of the analysis. Okay, Guillaume, I think that's enough for the first oh, okay. presentation. Uh, is there anything you want to say very fast or still? Uh, but thanks, thanks again for the opportunity. Okay, uh, I think we should, for the we should move forward to the next. Yeah. Okay, I'm so... Going to yeah, to kill my... Uh... So thank you so much, Guillaume. Uh, we appreciate your presentation, your, your insights. Thank you. Thank you also for the, uh, for the question from the, from the audience. And then we move to the second uh, presenter to, uh, of the session, which is Malt uh, Janos Borgost, okay, from University of Copenhagen. And the title of the paper is Commuting and the Gender Pay Gap. So, um, okay. So now we should see the screen from Multi, if I pronounce it correctly. Hello, do you hear me? 
Do you see my screen? Yes. Now we, we, we see you. Okay. I don't know if I pronounced correctly your name, sorry. Yes, uh, it's uh, Malte, and Malte? Uh, I'm actually at okay. the moment at uh, Alborg University. But that's okay. Fine. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, you know the rules. Uh, you can start whenever you want. Try to control your time. Otherwise, I will warn you when you have uh, about five minutes left. Okay? Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, thank you for organizing this uh, seminar. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our joint work here. It's um, work together with Ismail Mulalic and um, Jospan Oman. Um, and we talk, I will be ta talking about the commuting and the gender pay gap. Um, so our motivation is that um, over the recent decades, we, we've seen a decrease in the gender pay gap. Uh, mainly due to labor partic uh, increasing labor participation rates for women and um, reduced gaps in education skills. But um, in the last 10 years or so, uh, we see that it has been stagnating in most of the OECD countries, uh, whereas um, Denmark is uh, around 50%, uh, depending on how you control for it. But um, yeah, and, and this part puts Denmark at the lower end of the um, compared to the OECD countries. Um, we also see that the household burden uh, still remains um, unequally shared. Um, so we, we, are, uh, we are investigating how this unequally shared household burden is transmitted into the labor market. And uh, we claim that uh, the commu uh, gender commuting gap that you can see on the right hand side um, has something to do with, uh, with it. So there we see just the density distribution over um, the commuting distance for men, men and women um, separately. And we've seen that men commute uh, longer distances in, on average. Mm. So yeah, what is the commuting, uh, the role of the commuting, um, gender commuting gap in explaining the gender wage gap? <clears throat> we uh, draw upon existing literature. We see uh, there's a, a study from uh, Cleveland and others uh, they found that uh, children are at the core of gender inequalities. And um, uh, they claim it's mainly because uh, of a career interruption, um, more, more part-time jobs, a reduced working hours and slower wage progression for women that come with a, with a childbirth because um, of the increase in the household burden through the child. Um, women would uh, work less hours or maybe have slower wage progression or take breaks. and um, this has long lasting impacts on uh, the wages. Mm. But uh, we claim that it's also, uh, <coughs> uh, women also reconsider the time um, allocated to uh, commuting. Um, so this event study uh, on, the first, uh, on the birth of the first child uh, will give us a good um, um, identification strategy to find um, more out, uh, out more about uh, the commuting distance uh, and the impact on the gender pay gap. Um, so I will give you already uh, an idea of what, uh, what our findings are. We will show you that uh, the cost of commuting um, after the childbirth are uh, a lot larger than uh, for their male counterparts. And uh, we will also see that uh, women receive less compensation uh, for this increased uh, cost um, compared to men. And um, we then uh, will use this uh, compensation for commuting to uh, look at whether um, the impact on the gender pay gap is coming from the reduced uh, distance or from the reduced uh, com compensation for it. And uh, I can tell you now that it's the compensation. Um, yeah, this is my layout. Let's uh, dive right in. Um, this is our data. Um, we use full-time workers um, between 2003 and 30. Uh, we use data from the Danish administrative, uh, um, like Dan uh, Denmark statistic, which is very detailed. Um, and um, we modeled in a, in a way that we observe uh, the birth of the first child between 2000 and 2016. So the time frame is actually a little wider. So we have uh, less attrition um, 
So some of the parents already start with a child that is three years old. Um, commuting distance is calculated as the distance between workplace and residential address. And Uh, we uh, come to the model. Um, I see my internet uh, connection is not very good. Is it okay? Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, this is uh, how the event study looks like. Uh, on the x axis, we have the event time with a vertical line indicating the birth of the first child. Um, and we have the five years before and the five years, uh, the seven years afterwards. And um, on the y-axis, on, on the uh, graph to the left, we have uh, the annual income. And this is percentage change to the reference year. So what we do, it's just a set of dummies where we exclude uh, the uh, reference year before the birth of the first child. So in the case of the annual income, it would be at minus two. And then, um, we can interpret each of these estimates as, uh, for instance, at, um, at time event time two, women earn 18%, roughly 18% uh, less uh, compared to the year minus two before the childbirth. And um, for the annual income, we see that the, um, there's a, a quite a large gap of around 20%. So this is normalized. It's not absolute uh, values. It's, it's compared to the uh, year before. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, we see that, uh, so, so this, uh, sorry, this, uh, the annual income has been shown at, um, in the Cleveland paper that I mentioned earlier. And they even show that after 20 years, um, the uh, this gap still exists. So it's um, quite a big impact. And um, we then look at uh, the commuting distance. Where again on the x-axis we have the uh, the time event, uh, the event time from minus five until seven, and then um, on the y-axis we have the um, the effect of uh, the event time effect on the um, compared to the reference year at minus one in this case, and we see that uh, the male trend is in, um, pretty much uninterrupted. Um, and they're both converging um, before and then afterwards uh, women commute uh, less and less and we see a clear impact um, of the first child. So in year two, uh, women commute uh, around 6% less. So <coughs> moving on, um, we look at the, where, where does the difference in the commuting distance come from? And um, there's two options, either you uh, change your job or you move your residence. Um, here we have um, the percentage um, of our sample who moved uh, jobs in the given event time and um, who moved uh, residence um, also in the, in the given event time. And what we can see is that the, the level of job moves is already higher than the uh, level of uh, residence moves. And moreover, we find that the, um, the relevance of residence moves after the childbirth, which is um, what we're interested in, is um, declining in importance even. If we then um, split the, temp uh, the sample um, into subgroups and um, uh, carry out the event study again, we uh, look at um, one sample where we keep the residence uh, fixed um, and uh, people only move the job in the, in the time after the childbirth. And then uh, we, uh, the other sample to the right, uh, we have uh, people who move the residence but keep their job. Um, so we see the variation that comes from, from each, um, each set, uh, scenario. And what we can see um, that is that the, the gap between uh, the gender is, um, is larger for the labor market. So this again, like the, the one at the slide that I just showed you, um, shows that the labor market is uh, more important than um, the residential market. <clears throat> and it also means that uh, women move, um, move not closer to their job, but uh, rather uh, look for jobs that are closer to uh, their um, um, residence location. And this also speaks for, um, for the Danish setting 
because the residential market is uh, quite rigid, while the labor market is uh, relatively uh, flexible. Um, yeah, moving on to the <laughs> cost of commuting. Here we estimate a job mobility model um, in, in the form of a linear probability model. We also tested um, like hazard models and, and um, other specifications. Um, but here we can keep the full sample of around 3 million um, and uh, include fixed effects as well. Um, so how it looks like is that we, on the left-hand side, we have an indicator for the job change in the following period. And uh, then we press it on uh, the log income and the um, distance <coughs> in absolute values and kilometers actually. Um, and these uh, coefficients can be interpreted as um, um, how much less is a person inclined to change um, job if the income is raised by 1% or um, how much more willing is a person um, to change job if, the, uh, if they are commuting one kilometer longer. Um, we also include a couple of controls, which are time invariants. So um, yeah, we have a family status, uh, sector controls, firm size, region, and job tenure. Um, and uh, some of them, family status and sector, they are gender specific because um, we find strong evidence in the literature that um, this is the case. Um, we also use uh, individual and um, time fixed specs, as I mentioned. Um, what we can do then um, is uh, we, we can follow uh, Mons Foskerau and Jos van Omen, who is my co-author, um, that we can uh, that a worker trade off um, between lower commuting distance and uh, more income. So we can actually take the ratio and this will tell us something about the marginal willingness to pay com uh, for commuting. So um, if we want to um, calculate the marginal willingness to commuting and express it in terms of a Danish krona or monetary value by um, per hour, uh, we <clears throat> we would first need to transform it um, into um, into uh, travel time instead of distance, which we do with the average uh, speed. Then we have uh, this uh, ratio, uh, where, where's the um, which uh, um, indicates the trade-off, and then we multiply it by the hourly wage. So we take the um, the annual income and divide it by the annual hours and multiply it uh, by the hours of the day. So we get the value for a whole workday. <clears throat> and then um, to make it more comparable, because we have, um, uh, we have uh, this uh, would be now uh, <laughs> a value of Danish krona per hour. Um, we would uh, compare it to the uh, hourly wage, which is the W bar um, for uh, men uh, and women before and after. Um, just to give you a better um, feeling of how it relates to uh, the hourly wage. Um, if you compare it to uh, travel time survey um, analysis, um, where often the, there's also a monetary value for um, uh, travel time reduction, it, uh, this result is expected to be higher because it uh, reflects the long-term estimates and includes monetary and time costs, which are important to note. Okay, this is how it looks like. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the, the coefficients can be interpreted as um, a 1% one, a 1 um, income, uh, increase in income for women before the child uh, leads to a 5% less likelihood to change jobs. Um, and similarly, the distance is positive. Uh, so an increase of one kilometer in, uh, <coughs> in commuting distance uh, or uh, commuting distance that is one kilometer higher can be, um, is leading to a higher probability to change a uh, job as well, which is quite low, but yeah. So when we look at the trade-off, we see the marginal willingness to pay, uh, to pay per uh, hourly wage. Mm, and it's expected to be roughly around uh, two. So, um, yeah, in monetary value, it's probably something around 40 euros, if that helps. Um, and we see for, for men, it's, it's very uh, close, but we see 
that um, before and after. But, uh, but for women, we see that before it's roughly ten, uh, two, and then uh, there's a threefold increase in uh, the marginal willingness to pay uh, for commuting, which means that uh, women dislike commuting more after, um, after the childbirth. They want to uh, trade off more money for one uh, hour less of commuting. Um, we can also look at the distributions and look at their individual uh, income. And then it uh, is probably even more clear that we have the, um, here we have the density plots for commuting costs per average hourly wage again. Uh, finish in about three, four minutes, okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, we see women before, men before, and uh, men after, they're very close together. And then we see that women have a very um, high uh, cost of commuting. Okay, okay. let's uh, move on to the uh, compensation. So are women compensated for this higher cost? And um, we find, we, we use a wage regression. And uh, we find that um, before, men and women have very similar um, estimates, uh, roughly about 0.1%, uh, um, which is around uh, 120 uh, kroner, so 15 euros per, um, per hour. And afterwards, it's, uh, it's increasing, and the, the gap is, uh, uh, is increasing uh, between the men and women as well. So we see that the, the uh, gap goes from um, <laughs> a, a, a natural effect to um, uh, rather like it's tenfold. Um, so one, one digit increase. Um, if uh, individual fixed effects are not included, uh, we actually uh, see an increase, uh, which is in line with, uh, for instance, Manning, uh, Ellen Manning. And, um, if we uh, then look at uh, how it relates to the gender pay gap, we find uh, that the, the distance itself, so what if women would uh, commute the same distance as, as men, has a negligible uh, effect, but the compensation dif differential has actually a substantial effect. So um, if women would be compensated the same as men for commuting, um, the gender pay gap would uh, actually be reduced. Um, we find uh, something in the area of uh, three percentage points uh, for a 30% uh, percent, um, gender pay gap at the means. So the commuting uh, uh, gender gap contributes to the gender income gap, not because of the shorter commutes, but uh, due to less compensation for commuting. So to sum it up, um, we find that mothers commute less, that the cost of commuting increase, and uh, we find that uh, mothers are less com uh, um, compensated for commuting, um, although the costs increase. And uh, the, uh, it is mainly due to this compensation rather than the commu uh, shorter commuting distance uh, that uh, this is contributing to the gender income gap. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to questions. Hey, Mati, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. And also, thank you for sticking to, to, your, to your time constraint. OK, so, so far, there is just a single question from the audience uh, coming from Mark Ivaldi. He's asking, is there any potential, potential in the endogeneity uh, per problem between the revenue and the decision to move? So the revenue? The, the wages, the income. So, yeah, so the question is about the uh, endogeneity problem between the revenue and the decision to move. Uh, yes, it's, um, there, there, is some, uh, there are some problems. However, we, we use, um, um, we use uh, we're very careful with the uh, sample selection, first of all, and we also use um, uh, fixed effects, which should capture a lot of the um, the um, variation in the sample. Um, I have seen some some analysis who also uh, do it the other way, uh, but for our question at hand, I think it's it's the correct way to do it, and uh, we follow the uh, literature very closely. 
Uh, Nicole is asking if you control for the fact that wo that women uh, uh, are more likely to control to work part time. Yes, we use a full time sample. Okay, so we just for for, 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 for this analysis we, we use a full time sample. We also check for the part time, uh, and the effects are even uh, larger as we would expect. But uh, for some analysis, especially uh, when we look at the cost of commuting. Uh, the amount of hours is um, is very important, uh, so we we decided to stick with the full time sample for now. Okay, I don't know if there's any other question from the audience. Let me check. Yeah, it's another one. Okay, uh, Mark, do you wanna make your own question, uh, or or just a question from you mean the question from Maria? Yeah. Uh, are, are there any difference in the gender gap uh, with respect to cost of commuting time depending on the job sector or the income level? Yes, um, I can show you one more slide that I actually pre prepared. Um, so we see, for instance, um, do you still see it? Yeah. Okay. So here we have uh, one uh, one version of the mod. Do you also see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, here we see that for high incomes, it's actually larger, but we would also expect that high income earners um, have a higher willingness to pay. But the gap is larger or just the willingness to pay? The willingness larger. to pay. This yeah, is, but uh, not the gender gap. Also. No, we haven't looked at the gap yet, no. All right. But All right. You, you might, because my, what I thought was maybe if you, like the gender gap, if it's like women has less, um, to gain is become less compensated by community longer, maybe women with higher wages would be, so maybe then gender gaps would reduce. Mm -hmm. mm, I think if we uh, look at the distribution, um, we see quite clearly that the costs are uh, higher. And um, this is not, um, women have on average have uh, lower incomes. So if we multiply it with the with the higher, uh, with the lower in in income, and we still get a higher a marginal willingness to pay. Um, I think it's it's very robust. Yes, on the average. So my question is only about different parts of the distribution, income distribution. Maybe right. in another paper. How, how do you explain why? How do you explain why it's uh, um, much? Uh, the spread is uh, much larger. Uh, so you, you have a big peak with uh, not much variances, and then you have a small peak with large variances. Yes, I think this is mainly due to the fitting of the, um, of the uh, as you, if you're talking about the tails, I think it's about the fitting of this uh, kernel density. Um, but I see that the variance is, uh, is larger. I guess um, if we're talking about mothers, there's uh, there's still a lot of uh, a, a lot, they're in, in very different. Um, um, so we need to keep in mind that we have uh, we're looking at parents, and um, I think that uh, mothers are differently affected by this. So we would have um, the, the, the share of single mothers is higher, for instance, and um, the share of I mean we don't have it here, but part-time employment is also an issue. Um, I think the, the variation of, uh, of uh, people and uh, life circumstances we're looking at is just uh, bigger mm -hmm. okay. compared to women before, I mean. Okay, so thank you, Marty. Thank you for, uh, I mean, also to the audience for all your questions. And then uh, we should move to our next speaker. Okay. Uh, who is Juan Pablo Montero from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, presenting a paper entitled A Practical Approach for Carbon Congestion and Air Pollution, Driving Restrictions with Toll and Vintage Exemptions. Okay. So now we already have Juan Pablo here. Thank you, Ricardo. So uh, whenever you want, you can share your screen and the floor is yours. And remember to stick to your time, which is 20 minutes. All right, thank you, Ricardo, very much. And also thank you, the uh, organizers, for um, selecting the paper, uh, which is uh, joint work with uh, Leonardo Basso. 
who will be handling all the questions. <laughs> and also Felipe Sepulveda. And um, so uh, let's see. Okay, so here you have some pictures of different cities in, in Latin America, but this is a problem that happens all over the world. Uh, vehicle congestions and also local air pollution. By local air pollution, I mean uh, carbon dioxide, um, I'm sorry, monoxide, uh, NOx, and uh, hydrocarbons. So I'm not focusing here on global pollutants like CO2. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. And um, so the question is, uh, what do we do about this? And um, for congestion, of course, we economists understand that the best instrument is pricing, right? congestion pricing. But unfortunately, we don't see that much around the world. Only a few cities have implemented that. Uh, New York apparently is implementing that as well. A New York City, I mean, in, um, in 2021. And it may be, I don't know, we'll see, that after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, maybe more cities are willing to do that uh, because they need to create more incentives for people to move from cars to eventually to public transport. I think uh, we've all already seen some of that in London. They have increased, you know, the congestion charge. But this is an interesting question. What is gonna happen, you know, to public transportation and to congestion around the world after uh, the pandemic? Uh, it's over, which may take you know some time, as we all know. Um, so congestion pricing, we have discussed that, for example, in my home city in Santiago, but uh, currently there is no intention to implement anything like it. And, um, and I think in looking you know, to the far future, eventually with the autonomous vehicles, I think there's a need for road pricing, an urgent need for road pricing, absolutely, in order to these vehicles to operate uh, more freely. And um, so here is a political economy question. So if, if congestion pricing is so unpopular in many, many places, what are the alternatives? And here there's one, these are driving restrictions, which we've seen them in, in many places in, in Latin America, not only Latin America, but also in other, in other places that I'll show you in a minute. So the question is, how can you use these policies that apparently have some support uh, in order to implement some congestion alleviation, and at the same time, pollution alleviation. And um, typically, for these uh, driving restrictions come in the form of license uh, plate bans, in which, for example, depending on the last digits of your license plate, you may not be able to use your car every day of the week, maybe only I don't know, a few days. In Bogota today, you can only use it uh, only two and a half days of the week. And um, so, uh, and this, Policies, you know, in different formats are becoming more and more popular over the years. So Athens was the first to implement something like that, then Santiago. But now you have, you know, cities in, in, in Europe implementing, you know, some form of driving restrictions. For example, the low emission zones in many cities in Germany, these are driving restrictions. I mean, you cannot enter, you know, the city center if your car is, you know, if the, the, the emissions rates of your car are above certain levels. And Madrid also, they have, you know, these driving restrictions, you know, Madrid Central, in which if you have a hybrid or electric vehicle, you may enter the city center. If not, you cannot do that. So they come in different formats. So, and um, and uh, the idea we're, we're proposing here in this, in this paper is how you combine, you know, this, some exemptions, because the problem with these driving restrictions, this goes back, for example, to the Mexico famous policy, well, no circula, or today you cannot use your car, in which create an incentive for people to buy a second car. This is the typical, you know, critique that uh, this driving restrictions policies uh, receive, that uh, you create incentives for buying a second car. So what we're proposing here is to create exemptions to this driving restriction in order to avoid this problem. And at the same time, you know, to, of, of course, uh, increase uh, welfare. And, um, you can start, for example, with a simple design of one or two days a week restrictions, and eventually you can go higher with that. And um, so the idea is the following. Um, the day in which your car is restricted, you will have the option to pay a daily pass or a toll to use your car that day. However, you know, in order to also control for pollution, that exemption will be available only to some cars during the time in which pollution is a problem. 
When pollution is not a problem, that exemption is available to all cars, regardless of their vintage or regardless of how clean they are. But during the time of the year in which pollution is a problem, that exemption to pay at all to use your car the day in which you have a restriction will be only available to relatively clean cars. I'll come back in a minute to what we mean by clean cars. Okay, so here you have the two, you know, the two uh, exemptions uh, working. One uh, is the, the toll, and the second one is the vintage of your car. Those two things you know, together give you absolute exemption from the restriction. And um, the logic of this vintage uh, thresholds comes from a paper uh, in which we only focus on, on pollution. What we add in here is that we are combining these two problems together, pollution and congestion. We're treating them both together. Although with a short-term perspective, uh, in that paper also we look at the long-term perspective because when you introduce these vintage uh, driving restrictions, also what happens is that you create incentive you know, to accelerate the fleet turnover toward cleaner cars. We're not, in this paper, we are not paying attention to that, you know, dynamic uh, aspect of it. And only, you know, uh, we're taking a short-term perspective, say, you know, during the first year, when the fleet is, uh, is constant and, and, uh, and, uh, and consumers, you know, don't uh, update their, their cars. So one question you may have is, do we see these restrictions anywhere else, in, in, anywhere in the world? And in terms of vintage exemptions, yes, we see them in many places. Uh, in Santiago, for example, in 1992, cars that were uh, equipped with a catalytic converter were ex exempt from the restrictions. And uh, also in Mexico City today, for example, if you have a new car for the first eight years, you are not facing restrictions. Uh, if you have an electric car, the same thing, and, or a hybrid. In Paris, for example, you also have these vintage uh, restrictions. Cars that are 98 or older cannot enter the city center during weekdays from, I think, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., something like that. In Germany, low emission zones is the same. Madrid as well. You know, you're, basically, you are differentiating cars depending on their pollution, pollution rates. Uh, regarding toll exemptions, um, basically, that you can pay a daily pass in order to use your car day in which you face a restriction. There are only two places, two cities in the world in which, at least I'm aware of this, only these two places in which you can do that. One is in Cali that was implemented back in 2017 and the other one in Bogota that was implemented back in October last year. So these are the only two places in which you can pay, you know, a daily pass. It's like a congestion charge basically. During the day in which you have restriction, you pay this congestion charge and you just can use your car. So, um, so I think in any, you know, public policy is important not only to pay attention to efficiency, but also to distributional implications and more so, you know, uh, now than, than, than ever. So let me tell you a little bit about this uh, efficiency and distributional implication of uh, thinking about this hybrid policy. I think Dagansos was the first talking about this you know, driving restrictions with exemptions. And, um, and the idea, I mean, he was saying that maybe we can introduce this policy that would alleviate congestion by leaving everyone better off, rich and poor. And, um, and, and the idea is, is, is this, you know, a low income individual probably cannot afford to pay the toll because it's too expensive, but still that person is gonna be happy to you know, with this policy because the, the loss from not using the car maybe one or two days a week is gonna be more than compensated with the fact that he's gonna be able or she's gonna be able to use the car the other three days of the week or four days of the week and commuting is gonna be faster. So everyone is gonna be worse off. I mean, the, the, the rich is gonna be using the car all the time. He's able to afford to pay for this toll and he's gonna be commuting faster and the poor will still benefit, but perhaps not as much, but it will benefit. Well, it turns out, at least for data coming from our home city of Santiago, that that is not true. You know, if you introduce a one or two day restrictions and you implement, you know, the optimal toll, the rich, you know, are better off, but the poor are worse off. 
so it doesn't work. So what we are saying, what one important lesson from this paper is that, you know, all these distributional uh, concerns must be handled separately. You should collect all the toll, you know, revenues and distribute it back to individuals in a way in which you can leave everyone uh, better off. So that's a very important part of our, our paper. So let me tell you a little bit about a model and parameters. Uh, it's a very simple model, which is based on Basso and Silva. Uh, you know, have people that had to commute every day to, to work or to school during peak hours. You have two modes of transportation, cars and public transport. Some people own cars, some people don't. Cars, you know, are heterogeneous in their emissions rates. And, and you have, uh, you know, uh, your, your surplus from commuting you know, have three components, you know, depending on your preferences for transportation modes. Some people like public transport better than, than cars. Also, you know, the cost in comparing using one or the other, which depends on the toll that you had to pay on the public transport fare, you know, uh, and then the travel time, which is this component. Perhaps one, and you know, uh, driving by car takes less time than, than, than commuting by, by public transport. And, uh, and the regulator will have basically here three instruments. Uh, the number of data of restrictions R, which would be, be zero, no restrictions, basically it's a fair, to five, which is a full restriction every day. Basically it's like you go to congestion chart because every time in which you want to use your car, you have to pay a toll. And uh, then the, the level of this toll, this PC is the level of the toll. And then uh, the emissions rate, this is when, car, when pollution is a problem. Cars with emission, emissions rate below this threshold are the only ones that are entitled to pay this, uh, this toll. The other cars cannot do that. And finally, also the regulator may want to reduce the, the bus fare or the public transport fare. Here, you, I talk about buses, but also include metro uh, as well. And um, so, a very important element of our analysis is the distributional implication of these policies. So we divide commuters in five income groups. What is important here, pay attention, this is the lowest income group and the highest group number five. Pay attention to the car ownership. You know, the low income group, only 16% of that group own a car and among the rich, 95% uh, own a car. And that is gonna play an important, important role. And, um, uh, that here there are you know, different parameters that enter into the model. I'm gonna skip that. And this is also very important. You see, depending on your income group, you know, the car that you own is, is very different. Uh, so here you have a distribution of all the cars owned by the different income groups, where they're subcompact, compact, midsize, you know, SUV, and so on. And also, you know, some cars are run, run on gasoline, petrol, and the other run on, run on diesel. And why this is important is because it's important because of pollution, you know, they emit different gases, as I can show you in the next slide. You know, here you have the different type of cars, compact, the different age of the car, and uh, the different fuel. And for example, here you have two pollutants, local pollutants, hydrocarbons and uh, NOx, and uh, nitrogen oxides. And you can see, for example, older cars emit a lot more than new cars. This is very different from global pollutants like CO2, in which you know, the emissions rate doesn't change much over the years, actually remains quite constant. But for local pollutants, it makes a huge difference whether your car is a new car or it's an old car. Uh, and that is very important to, to, keep in, to keep in mind. As well, there's an important difference between the type of cars, you know, SUVs, they emit more than subcompact and compact, for example. And also, depending on whether you run your car on diesel or gasoline, there's a, there's a, dif there's a difference. All that play a role, you know, in designing the optimal, the optimal policy. And here you have a fit of our model. And let me show you some results. Let me go first to the case in which pollution is not a problem. So here you have only concerns about congestion. And depending on whether you implement a one-day restriction, you know, this is a, this lower line here, or a five-day restriction, and depending on the toll that you uh, that you establish, your, your surplus is going to change, right? For example, if you introduce a thirteen-dollar toll daily pass that you have to pay to use your car, and you introduce a five-day day restriction, basically this is congestion charge. Every time that you want to use your car, you have to pay this daily toll. Well, you can uh, increase welfare by uh, a good amount, which is about 
0.5% of uh, our country's uh, GDP. So we're talking about a big, big number here. So here is one question whether you want to go, eventually you want to go to a five day restrictions for political economy reasons. Maybe you want to start with one day restrictions or two day restrictions. And as you move on and you get more public support, then you may start moving to a higher, a higher level. Now, that was the overall surplus, you know, um, gained from introducing uh, this, this policy. Now the question is, um, what happened to the distributional implications of this policy? And let me first look at the case in which all the uh, toll revenues are sent back to the different income groups in the same numbers that they were collected. So there's no, there are no transfer between income groups. If you do that, you know, the poor, this is the lowest income group, they are really worse off. Why? Well, because mostly here, I will show you why is that, is because can, car owners in that group, they cannot afford at all, and they can have to leave their car at home, and they're really worse off. Uh, the people that don't own a car also are worse off, but most of the damage is done by people that own a car. And why these people are worse off, for example, the ones that, are, that, that just were using public transport before, well, because it's more crowded. That's the reason why they're now, they're also worse off. But the, most of the damage comes from the fact that many of these people were commuting by car and now they cannot afford to do that. And, and, and the more, you know, you, um, if you move from one to five day restrictions, here is the dark line, is the five day restriction, of course, the damage is even higher. What happened to the highest income group, group number five? Well, these people are very happy. These are the richest people and they, most of them own a car, they commute by car. Not all of them, but most of them commute by car. And they're very happy because um, they can uh, commute much faster than, 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 than before. And uh, that's why they, are, they like, for example, a five days restriction, basically congestion charge. Now, if we uh, look at uh, how the uh, surplus from these uh, from these people, you know, uh, split between those that own a car and between those that do not. Again, the people that do not own a car and that they still commute, there are very few, but still there are some, they're worse off because, you know, the public transport, transport system is, is more crowded. And that's the reason why they're worse, they're worse off. Now, let's think about more intelligent ways in which you can recycle these toll revenues back to, you know, the, uh, the, the commuters. And one way to do it is to take all this money collected from the toll, pay mostly by the rich, and to reduce the public transportation fare. And if you do that, and if you implement, for example, a five days restriction, and the toll is set at the optimal level, about $12, $13, well, you can reduce the fare by 70%. Today is about $1 each right is, one, uh, is, is about that. So we are reducing, we can reduce in 70%. So it's a huge reduction in terms of prices. If you do the, that, now, you know, people in the uh, lowest uh, income uh, um, group are better off, strictly better off because of this huge transfer. Now, interestingly, of course, the people that were using the, 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 the subway before and the, and the buses before are better off, this group here to the right. Uh, because they are paying less, even if it's more crowded, still, you know, for them, the fact that they're paying a, a lot less makes them uh, worse, uh, much better off. And more so if you introduce a five day restriction, this upper, you know, dark line here, than if you do, if you introduce only a one day or a two day restriction. Uh, interestingly, here is a group of people that own a car. Not many, but still some. And for this guy, what would be optimal, if you're gonna do this, is to introduce, for example, a five-day restrictions, collect a lot of money, and give that money you know, back to, to them in the form of lower uh, fares. So this is the way in which you, get, you know, can make everyone in this uh, lowest income group better off. By implementing a five-day restrictions, very aggressive, and the total you know, set at the optimal level. Why? Very simple, because you can collect a lot of money so you can, you know, come up with a big reduction in the public transport uh, fare. Um, not news for the high income groups. They're still, you know, uh, uh, much better off because of, you know, the faster commute. 
and uh, and these guys, for example, are still worse off. Even if you uh, you return, uh, if, if you reduce the uh, the public transport fare, these people are still worse off. And the reason is because for these people, it's more important the quality of the service than the price. And the fact that now it's more crowded really reduces, you know, their um, their benefits. That's the reason why these guys still are still worse off, despite this, this, this big big transfer in terms of lower prices. Now. Uh, you can also uh, combine reductions in the transport, um, public transport fare with, you know, improvements in the quality of the service. So you can use, you know, the toll revenues to do both. And when you do it in the optimal way, at least using, for example, all this data is based on Santiago. In some places, you know, maybe the, the fraction of money that you want to use to improve the quality of the service could be more. Sorry others. to interrupt, uh, Juan Pablo, you should uh, finish in about three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Uh, then I'm, I'm, I'm good. Then you are, um, you are, for example, in that particular case, for example, here is a high income group that were commuting by, by, by public transport before, and now they're better off because you're also increasing the, the quality of the transport service. Now, I have two more slides. Uh, when you add pollution, things change but only in one way. Uh, in the case of Santiago, for example, what happens in spring and summer is very different from what happens in fall and winter. In spring and summer, po local pollution is not, it's not a problem. So, so what you have seen is the optimal design. Uh, so all car owners should be entitled to pay the toll if they want to. Pollution still goes down by 27% because many people you know, decide not to pay the toll and leave the cars at home. Uh, and here, welfare comes mostly from less congestion. 86% of the welfare gain comes from less congestion, 14% from less pollution. In fall and winter, it's completely different. The story, because now pollution is a, is a serious problem. So here, what you want to do is you want to introduce, uh, maintain the toll exemptions, but only make them available to gasoline cars that are 16 or less years old. Why? Because, you know, all the cars are very, very, um, polluting. And, uh, and also you want to differentiate between gasoline and diesel cars. Diesel, you know, they emit more. That's why the threshold is a little bit tighter for diesel cars. And, and when you do that, and you introduce, for example, a five-day restrictions, pollution goes down by 71%. And now the contribution to welfare between less pollution and less congestion completely reversed. Now pollution in, in, in fall and winter is much more important. They contribute with 59% uh, to uh, the welfare gains and uh, less congestion contributes with 41%. So my last slide, I have, I guess I have one minute, Ricardo. And um, yes, driving restrictions, here is a political economy. If you want uh, motivation of working on this, on this paper, we see these driving restrictions are, 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 are increasingly popular in many, in many places. So uh, the question is how we can use them more wisely in terms to fight both congestion and local air pollution. This has been our, our main motivation. And uh, so following this, uh, these two papers, you can combine both kind of exemptions, right? Toll exemptions and also vintage exemptions to get the best out of these uh, driving restrictions. Otherwise, if you don't introduce these exemptions, you are gonna really do, re it's better to do nothing. I mean, we show that in Barona, there are many papers. If you don't introduce these exemptions, better do nothing. I said it again. Why? Because if you don't, people are going to buy a second car. There is plenty of evidence documented that. We also do it in the, in the Barona paper documenting that. Uh, that is a really bad policy. Only you have to combine these restrictions with these exemptions. Otherwise, you're in really bad, bad ground. Um, and the reason is because you eliminate this uh, incentive to buy a second, a second car. Um, we think this, I think, again, from a political economy perspective, you want to start perhaps with mild restrictions, maybe one day a week, two days a week, and eventually over time, as you get more public support for this policy, as, as people see, you know, less pollution and um, particularly less congestion, then you can start moving up, you know, higher until you reach five days of restrictions. And, uh, and last point, distributional implications are crucial to be you know, attended. The way to do it is to attend it separately, to take all the collection from the toll 
and to use it wisely, mostly to reduce the public transport fare in order to leave all income groups better off. I finish with that. Okay. Looking forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the nice presentation. Yeah. The, the, there's a question from Moes, but I don't know if you have already answered at the end of your presentation. He's wondering uh, that uh, uh, the tolls uh, uh, make people live in cars on streets, but it, I think that you probably have already answered this by the end of your presentation. I, I don't want to. I, I don't know if you want to add something to. To, to that discussion. Uh, Mark is asking whether uh, we should have taxes that depend on millage. Uh, and then um, I have also uh, some questions myself. Uh, the first one uh, it comes to the beginning of your presentation. When you talk about driving restrictions, uh, uh, you talk about the restrictions that depend on the number of the plate, so the plate number, and also the ones based on low emission zones. Uh, and I think uh, these are two demand restrictions, so quantity restrictions that are not price-based, but quantity-based. And, and I think they are very, very different. Uh, so in the case of the plate uh, number restrictions, you have these incentives to buy a second car, so you may, you may end up with more pollution, more, more congestion, et cetera. But it, the, the effect is not the same with low emission zones. So I think uh, it, it's, it's interesting to differentiate between the two. So we, with low emission zones, it may be very regressive, and uh, so it, it may be a bad policy as well, but you don't have this incentive to buy a, a, another car. What, you have the incentive to replace your, the polluting cars by, by cleaner cars, okay? And uh, uh, then, um, mm -hmm, what else? Uh, 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 okay, time up, okay, let's go. For the, for the answers. Yeah, let me start. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Let me start with your questions first. Uh, I think they're yeah they're different, but if you both, you know, we see both of these two restrictions can be understood as vintage restrictions. In which sense? For example, with the license plate, you can say, look, if you have an old car, and if you are the the last digit of your license plate ends, I don't know, in one, two, whatever. You cannot use your car maybe one, two days a week. But if you have a clean car, you face no restriction. And with that, you completely eliminate the incentive to buy, you know, a more polluting car to bypass restriction. What you do, and this is exactly, we know, the evidence from, uh, from, uh, from Santiago, what you do, you buy a more clean car. That's what you do. So this is the way in which you can kill that incentive, regardless of whether you're using, for example, uh, uh, a license plate ban or a, a low emission zone because the low emission zones, you're right, it actually tells you no matter what car, I mean, the only cars that can enter the city are this type of cars, clean car, that's it, period. With a license plate, you can get the same idea simply by providing, you know, the owners an alternative, which is to buy a cleaner car. And they're not going to buy, you know, a second old car to buy price restriction. It's more expensive. It's better to buy a cleaner car. And this is exactly the evidence that we found, for example, in Santiago and also in Mexico with the new, with the new programs. And uh, but at the end, both are uh, vintage uh, uh, specific restrictions. Now, uh, taxing by uh, by the use of the car is no so easy because you can always manipulate you know the autometer and it has been proposed many many times but it's, it's, it's no so simple and uh, that's why for example in london what you do is you just tax you know uh, at all to to enter the city and uh, so it's, it's difficult to to monitor that uh, probably I don't, I don't know of any system that use that you know taxing by the by, by the mileage just and, ask uh, just ask Google. Just ask Google. They, they they have all your data. Well, eventually, maybe you can do it. But so far, I don't know of any place in which you you do that. I think uh, the places in which you have at all. I mean, you pay for using your car. Basically, is uh, if you cross a portal, and then you have to pay, for example, the uh, this. And this is the same the same way in which, for example, New York is planning to implement the uh, the toll. Right. If you enter, you know, the uh, the city below, I don't know, uh, the 29th, I don't remember, no, 59, I think, Avenue, uh, yeah. in the lower zone of Manhattan, if you enter that zone, then you pay the toll. But if and I can... This is the way it's implemented. 
if I enter in uh, in London and I uh, with my small car and I keep uh, running uh, my car, I, I'm going to pollute a lot compared to my yes. very big car. And just I, I will make just one kilometer with my big car. So it's very important. All all this system where you have just a toll on access is probably less efficient. And it's for this reason that there is all, all this uh, system of bypassing. I fully agree with you, Mark. Fully agree. I mean, these are second best or third best, you know, policies. And, uh, but this is the reality. Uh, eventually, we would like to charge by the mile and also by the type of vehicle that you, you own. For example, if you have a sport car that emits a lot, or if you have a, you know, a, a smaller car, you should pay less. What London is doing, for example, is also adding to the congestion charge, for example, another charge depending on the type of vehicle that you that, that you you run, which is uh, I think is is not the best, you know, it's not the ideal instrument, but it's going in the right direction, trying to you know create incentives for you to move to cleaner cars. Uh, these are all service or second best policies, Mark. But I think we haven't yet reached the point in which you're using you know a first best instrument like taxing by the mile at the time of the day in which there's congestion congestion because this is I'm, I'm also perhaps you have that also in mind you know congestion is created you know very localized and also depending on the time of the day but we are not at that point yet eventually i think we're going to move in that direction over time we, we, we can see some of that in the future but so far we're talking about just trying to reduce congestion the best we can with you know simpler instruments. I think, and this paper is basically pointing in that direction, using instruments that have some political support. They're not ideal, but at least you know provide you some congestion alleviation and also some pollution alleviation. And also, there was a question about the toll at the beginning. That yes, you want to differentiate. For example, in London, the way you do it, as I just mentioned before. If you own an older car, you have to pay more. The congestion charge goes up by, I don't know, could go up even by 50% or even more. I don't have the, the, the numbers on top of my head. But here we are trying to introduce something similar, not exactly equal. Instead of just charging more to the people that own an older car, we're just simply saying, look, uh, because this is, you, you can just not buy this, uh, this daily pass, so you cannot just use it all. Uh, you have to leave your car at home if your car is, is, okay. is old enough uh, during the time in which pollution is a, is a problem. So this is the way we, we do it here in, in this paper, which is more, you know, um, consistent with a driving, driving policy, which is whether, as, as you mentioned, Ricardo, these are quantity-based instruments. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I think we should leave it here. Uh, I'm sorry, there are now several uh, more questions in the in the chat, but we cannot uh, cover all of them. There's there's a concern about the affordability uh, to buy cars by poor people, but I guess that in your system, what you are doing is to provide subsidies to use public transportation. It's not to, to give incentives to buy new new cars. But all anyway, right. uh, we can we can uh, eventually you can we can keep the discussion later on. But now we need to move forward to the to the next speaker. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, then we move to our last speaker uh, from this first idea webinar session. Uh, initially, uh, the presenter was uh, Alex uh, Lutman, but uh, finally, uh, the paper is going to be presented by his co author, Daniel Ladd from UC Irvine. And the title you have already on your screens is Loyalty Rewards and Redemption Behavior Stylized Facts for the US Airline Industry. So, uh, Daniel, Dan, if you are there, you can you can go ahead and uh, remember to stick to your time. Twenty minutes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is my first uh, ITA conference, so uh, online, but hopefully, look forward to getting to meet a lot of you guys in person next year in uh, Rome. So, uh, like was mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Ladd. I'm a graduate student at UC Irvine. This is joint work with Alexander Lutman, who's uh, from the Mitre Corporation. Uh, what we're going to be presenting today is loyalty rewards and redemption behavior stylized facts for the U.S. airline industry. So to give you a sense of kind of where we're going to go for today's presentation, we're going to briefly define the size of the U.S. frequent flyer market. 
We're going to describe our method that we have to identify frequent flyer tickets in one of the most used airline databases, which is the Department of Transportation's Airline Origin and Destination Survey, also known as the DB1B. We're going to describe how frequent flyer award tickets differ from paid tickets, and we're going to identify some of the characteristics of markets that have large shares of these frequent flyer passengers on it. To give you a preview of what these results are going to look like, we're going to show that frequent flyer tickets have more stops and are on longer and higher fare routes relative to paid tickets. However, it does appear that these differences between frequent flyer tickets and paid tickets is declining over time. That is, as we get further into our sample, we're finding that frequent flyer tickets and paid tickets are more similar. We're also going to show that frequent flyer tickets are more likely used to go to airports with really high seasonal variation in demand. This means airports that see lots of travel in certain times of the year and less travel otherwise. So this is often ski destinations or vacation spots. We're also going to show that markets that have large shares of passengers traveling on frequent flyer awards tend to have lower load factors and also lower fares if they're coming out of a hub airport, but higher fares if they're coming from non-hub airports. So like I said, a lot of this is going to revolve around the DB1B database. For those of you who aren't directly familiar with this, this is a 10% sample of all domestic passenger tickets on US carriers. Um, and this is reported quarterly. Uh, this is one of the main data sets that gets used in both reduced form and structural IO. Um, it's really common data set that's been used for a wide variety of papers to answer a lot of different questions that we might have, uh, both in the IO literature as well as some other literatures as well. So um, this is a very commonly used data set. One of the things that is, is a common assumption that most of the papers that use this database um, take is they assume and they remove tickets with fares below a certain cutoff, usually $20 or $25. And this is done because they are often assumed that these are either heavily discounted frequent flyer tickets, uh, special sale tickets that may not be available, or various other non-revenue passengers. We wanted to explore how valid is this assumption uh, we want to know how large is the frequent flyer market and how is it kind of changing over time? And do we have a method to credibly identify frequent flyer award tickets in this data set? Right, so to get a sense of how big this market is, uh, here's, for example, six large airlines in the United States. We have this for other carriers as well as going back slightly further, but for this slide, just kind of shortening it down. Right, and so you can see that frequent flyer tickets are a non-insubstantial portion of the market. So this is reported by airline. It's the percent of revenue passenger miles that were frequent flyer award tickets. Uh, you can see there's a lot of variation among the different carriers. Southwest tends to have one of the higher uh, rates of frequent flyer award tickets versus JetBlue is much smaller. Um, like I said, this is a pretty large segment of the market, right? Somewhere around six or seven percent. Uh, to give you an idea, these particular six carriers in 2018, this represents roughly just shy of 50 million frequent flyer award tickets. So again, it's a, it's a reasonably large part of the market. So the question is, how can we identify this? And so not all tickets below this $20 fare cutoff are actually frequent flyer awards, right? There could be zero fare non-revenue passengers. So this can be friends and family of airline employees that might be flying standby, actual airline employees themselves. You can also imagine uh, airlines sometimes give away flights if things are canceled or rerouting and that kind of stuff. Some are actual paid fares, right? Um, there are discount carriers such as Frontier and Allegiant that actually sell tickets that would be less than $20, right? So these could also show up. To identify these frequent flyer award tickets, we're going to explore a federal regulation that established the TSA uh, security fee, also called the September 11th security fee. And crucially, so this is a security fee that's levied on all revenue tickets. So when you go buy a ticket, you'll often see a fee attached to it. You, every ticket that is purchased in the United States among domestic destinations has to pay this fee. It helps subsidize um, the TSA, the security administration that oversees airports. Crucially, the security service fee must also be imposed on passengers who obtain the ticket for air transportation with a frequent flyer award, but you do not impose it on any other non-revenue passengers. And this is what's written in the Federal Register for how to apply this rule, right? So what does this mean? This means that any ticket that you actually purchase, you have to pay the price of the actual ticket plus this fee, and any flight that you're getting for free, you don't end up paying this TSA security fee unless it's a frequent flyer ticket. 
And so this is really important because in the DB1B database, right, that 10% sample of tickets, it includes, it gives you the fare of the ticket inclusive of these fees. Right. So what this means is if we look at a distribution, well, so sorry, before we get to that, there was also a law change that happened in 2014 that changed the structure of how this uh, fare was applied. So the fare depends based on whether or not you have a round trip ticket and how many segments you are. So in 2002, um, when this law was initially passed, right, the fee ex increased for the more segments you had on a one way trip. Um, and then increased additionally for round trips. In 2014, they simplified that fee structure, and now you just pay $5.60 for a one-way ticket, irrespective of the number of segments, and you pay $11.20 for any round trip ticket. So when we go into the DB1B database, if we restrict fares, just looking at fares below $20 and do a histogram, this is what it looks like for a variety of years. Right. So on the left hand side here, this is the share of tickets that are under $20. Across the bottom here is just the distribution of where those fares are. Um, for simplicity, I've binned all the fares between $12 and $20 into that one category. So you can see for 2005 and 2010, these are both under the old fare structure. Right. You can see there are spikes at zero. These would be non-revenue passengers that are not frequent flyer tickets, because if they were frequent flyer tickets, they would have to pay the TSA security fee. And then we see spikes at $2, $5, $7, and $10, which is exactly where we would expect to see spikes if these were frequent flyer tickets that were just paying the TSA security fee. We also see there are some tickets that are in this $12 to $20 category, which are likely these heavily discounted fares. So these are tickets that people are actually purchasing that they had to pay the cost of the ticket and the TSA security fee fare. Right. We can also see looking in 2015 and 2018, this is after that change. Now, again, the, it simplifies and now we only see a spike at five and a spike at 11 while we continue this spike at zero. Right. So again, these are likely these frequent flyer tickets. Now, the other thing we can do is we can exploit the fact that we know what the fare should be for each ticket type, right, depending on round trip and number of segments. So we can actually divide that out for each carrier. So this is the distribution for Delta. These are flight fares under $20 in 2013, which is in red, and 2015, which is in blue. It's arranged in four panels here by what the expected TSA security fare, the expected TSA security fee would be in 2013. So this panel here, which is $2.50, you remember back to that previous table, that would be corresponding to a one-way nonstop ticket. And we can see here, right, that there is about 80% of those observations that are tickets under $20 that are one way nonstop, right? About 80% of those, we actually see the recorded fare of $2, right? So again, this should really only be frequent flyer tickets because if these were revenue tickets, it would be recording the price of the fare plus the TSA security fee. And if they were non-revenue that weren't frequent flyer tickets, then they should be showing up at this zero. We can also see in 2015, after the policy change, right, that now our spike is at five, and this directly reflects what happened with the TSA security fee change, where now any one-way ticket, irrespective of how many segments, is now $5.60, right? We see the same spikes going on here, where we expect $5. In 2013, this could be a round trip nonstop, or it could be a one-way with multiple stops, which is why in 2015, you see a spike at both five and 11. And again, for 750 and $10, um, we see the spikes um, directly match what we would expect they would be given the TSA security fees. We can see this is relatively similar for other carriers. Here's the same distribution for American, um, and here's the distribution for Southwest, right? And you can see Southwest is actually one of those carriers that doesn't do as many of these non-revenue passenger um, miles, right? So now that we kind of have established how we can identify what are very likely frequent flyer tickets, we want to know, okay, what are the characteristics of these tickets and how do they differ from paid tickets? And we're going to do that in this descriptive analysis by estimating the following equation. So on the left hand side, we're going to have a series of different dependent variables that we want to test what, how they differ between frequent flyer and non-frequent flyer passengers. We're going to estimate this as an equation of uh, whether or not it is a frequent flyer ticket and then control for the round trip status. Um, we're also going to include a quarter of year fixed effects and airline origin and airline destination fixed effects. 
the variable of interest that we're looking at here is beta one. And what I'm actually going to show you are a series of charts that are going to display beta one and its 95% confidence interval. And we estimate this equation separately for every year. So allowing for a fully flexible model. We're going to do this with the airline destination and airline origin fixed effects and without, so you can get a sense of how that changes. So to see what that looks like. So here, this is difference in number of segments. So our left-hand side variable here is the number of segments that each ticket has, right? Looking at the red line first, this is where we don't include the airline origin and airline destination fixed effects. This still has quarter of year fixed effects in it. So we can see here that this is the beta one coefficient. So this is the coefficient on frequent flyer tickets. So we can see that frequent flyer tickets relative to paid tickets have about two tenths more segments on them on average. Right, controlling for airline origin and airline destination fixed effects, that falls to around uh, 0.17, right? So what we can say from this is it appears like on average frequent flyer award tickets have more stops. So each segment is separated by a stop, right? So there's gonna be more stops or more segments than paid tickets. The other interesting thing about this is we can see that this effect is declining over time, right? When we look at 2015, 16, 17, 18, right? Frequent flyer award tickets don't look as different from paid tickets as they did back in 2005. So this is suggestive potentially that individuals are now viewing frequent flyer uh, awards as more you know, direct cash, right? It, it's more of a commodification of the frequent flyer market. We don't know for sure, but it's at least suggestive of that. We can also see how this uh, looks for other variables of interest. So if we look at the difference in distance flown, right again, you can see frequent flyer award tickets are likely to be um, longer distances. This can be a function of both that there are more stops, so they might not have as efficient of a route, but it's also an indication that the particular markets they're choosing to fly in might be longer distances, right? So for instance, in the United States, if you're going to be using a frequent flyer award ticket disproportionately more often to go to someplace like Hawaii, that's going to be a longer distance flow. Again, we see the same relationship where this is declining over time. Right? We can also see this for difference in weighted average fare. Frequent flyer award tickets tend to be on slightly more expensive routes. For HHI, it's very noisy, but maybe we can say it's slightly more competitive routes. But again, the same thing where it appears like this relationship is deteriorating over time. Finally, the last one is difference in seasonal variation in demand. So this is looking just at the destination where are individuals flying to. Higher seasonal variation in demand says that these, these are airports that have more spiky demand, right? They're more likely to have more travel in certain parts of the year than others, right? And so we can see that people are going to these. These are likely vacation destinations. To give you a sense of why we're also thinking that, I'm going to show you a map of one particular carrier, just to simplify it. So this is Delta's uh, route network limited to uh, flight segments that had at least 15% frequent flyer share on them in quarter one of 2016. So quarter one, this is January, February, and March. So this is winter time. You can see that this is uh, Delta. So it has its you know, normal hub structure where there's a hub at Atlanta, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, uh, LA, and New York City, right? And you've noticed that there are a whole bunch of flights coming in right here. For those of you not familiar with the United States, these are the Rocky Mountains. So these are ski destinations, right? January, February, March, this is prime ski season. This is when you have uh, holidays in the US, such as Martin Luther King weekend and President's Day weekend, where people are going to go skiing a lot. You also see a lot of flights going to Hawaii as well, which is another common popular ski destination in the winter. Now we can look at how this changes in the summer, right? So looking at quarter three now, you can see that the flights kind of shift further north, right? Just flipping back and forth between these, you can see that there's a shift more northerly, right? It's warmer now, you can go more north. Um, there is some overlap with we're still in the Rocky Mountains, but now this is Yellowstone National Park right here. This is Glacier National Park. This is Olympic up here and Orlando is where Disney World is. Uh, it also turns out Traverse City, Michigan has a really big cherry blossom festival that people get very excited about. So we think that's also what's driving um, there, right? So this is suggestive of the fact that, um, again, these markets that, um, these segments that consumers are choosing to use frequent flyers on are likely more vacation oriented destinations as opposed to business destinations. Okay, so that was kind of the ticket level descriptive analysis. We now kind of want to look at the market level analysis and get a sense to determine how market and product quality characteristics can influence the share of passengers traveling on frequent flyer awards. Um, this gives us some idea of potentially both the consumer's choice, right? Where consumers are choosing to use frequent flyers, what types of market, but also airline choice in their ability to restrict what markets frequent flyers can use their tickets on. 
So in this case, we're going to be estimating, estimating an equation um, of the following form. So on the left-hand side, we have the frequent flyer share of a particular carrier's product. And in this case, we're saying a product is a specific routing. So this is direct service or sequence of connections that are in a particular market. A market is an origin destination pair, and this is directional. So the idea is one market would be uh, LAX to LaGuardia Airport, right? It, that would be separate from LaGuardia to LAX. That would be a market, it's that pair. The, per, the particular products that could exist would be airline specific and would be potentially direct flights, direct round trip flights, or a, a separate product that would connect through Chicago, right? We're gonna estimate this product level frequent flyer share as a function of fare of that airline's product Fare interacted with whether or not it left from a hub origin for that carrier, the HHI of the market, an indicator of whether or not this product was a nonstop product, whether it was a round trip product, what the routing quality of that product is. In this case, routing quality is a ratio of the distance you had to travel compared to the straight line distance, and load factor. Load factor is going to be a measure of capacity constraint. So it's going to say on the product you're traveling for the carrier you're traveling, what's the segment that was most capacity constrained, how full was that um, segment, right? So what percent of seats were filled by passengers? We're also going to include market level fixed effects, airline quarter year fixed effects, airline origin fixed effects, and airline destination fixed effects. Now, before we can estimate this, right, fare is likely endogenous due to potential selection bias. So we're gonna instrument for fare using two different instruments. One is the number of competing products offered by other carriers with an equivalent number of connections, right? So we're gonna look within the same market, we're gonna look at other products that don't necessarily follow the exact same route, but have the exact same number of stops, right? This gives us a sense of what the competition is within that kind of market conditional on number of stops. We're also gonna use as an instrument the interaction of product distance with jet fuel price. So I can that, uh, two, two, three minutes to, to okay. go. We're just going these results and then we're done. So to give you just a sense of these uh, summary statistics, we're limiting from years 2005 to 2018. We're going to restrict to airline markets with at least 500 passengers in the quarter and products with at least 50 passengers in the quarter. Uh, the key point here is that the frequent flyer share, the average frequent flyer share of these products is about 6.7%. Um, and again, to get the, um, to understand what the interpretation of this routing quality is, that 1.3 suggests that on average, these products are 30% further than just straight line distance, right? So to then run this market level regression as the IV, what we can see is that for consumers leaving from non-hub airports, right, they're more likely to be on higher fare routes. However, when they're leaving from a hub airport, this is likely an airport with a higher level of dominance for that carrier, right? The sign now switches and it's larger in magnitude, right? This is suggestive that the airlines actually have more control over what routes passengers are allowed to fly on going out of hubs, right? Um, the other thing to note here is for nonstop routes, right? Again, this is negative, which suggests that there are fewer frequent flyer passengers on nonstop routes. Again, this is maybe that airlines are restricting access to these for frequent flyers. Routing quality is negative. Remember the interpretation of that is, is somewhat opposite of what you would expect, right? What this is saying is that conditional on being a connecting route, um, passengers are, frequent flyer passengers are more likely to be on more efficient routes, right? So that suggests that airlines might restrict their ability to go on nonstop routes, but when passengers are choosing between connecting routes, they're gonna choose the more efficient route. Finally, load factor is relatively large and suggests that on capacity constrained segments, uh, airlines are less likely to allow frequent flyer passengers to use those. Right, so hopefully this was kind of illuminating of what kind of the frequent flyer market looks like and we kind of wanted to get this out as a potential jumping off point for other people um, to start looking at what the effects might be of various other exogenous uh, shocks on frequent flyer awards. So, the idea being you could look at the effect of code sharing, of air, uh, airline branded credit cards, you could look at changes to frequent flyer award programs over time. Um, so we're really excited to kind of share this. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions now in the chat, but also if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or my co-author Alexander, uh, and we're happy to talk about this more.
Okay, Dan, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. You also respect the time constraint, so thanks for that. I don't know if there's any uh, question from the audience. Um, so far, there were no not uh, there was no question in the in, on the chat. There's Mark who is asking why do airlines keep these programs? Um, airlines keep these programs because they can foster brand loyalty, right? So it gives an incentive for individuals to continue to right. uh, fly a particular carrier repeatedly. Um, which gives them some degree of market power. So it allows them to hopefully raise prices a little bit. So there's been some evidence of that. Um, Mara Letterman has a paper that suggests that frequent flyer programs might actually be part of the cause of the hub premium effect, that uh, airlines can charge more at a hub because individuals are willing to fly that carrier more to get more frequent flyer miles. Yeah. So it's a way to, to enhance uh, brand loyalty to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, and, and which also makes this, you know, somewhat um, broadening to other cases where companies are trying to establish brand loyalty through rewards programs and stuff. So there'd be this Starbucks has a rewards program, um, lots of other, you know, online retailers and stuff allow the same sort of point generation, but then might restrict how you can redeem those points. So, uh, well, I don't know if, is there any other question uh, so far? Uh, so, so you basically think that we should not neglect this this part of the of the sample, right? Yeah, I don't think we should be throwing out this, you know, six to seven percent of the market just because you know we don't know as much about it. We're trying to illuminate here, and you know, there could even be effects of particular routes, you know, might have higher or lower weighted average fare than what the airline actually cares about because they're subsidizing that because this is a product. Yeah. Lots of people want frequent flyer miles on versus one that not people do. So I mean, that's, that, that's the thing that I, that, I, that I find particularly particularly interesting is that in this part of the sample that is often neglected, there are things that are, are interesting because precisely the behavior is different to the rest of the sample. So yeah, and and an interesting question that we're hopefully going to try and dig into as well is kind of who's getting potentially bumped from these flights, right? Are these yeah. replacements for low fare passengers or are these replacements for potentially higher fare passengers? Um, and that's not abundantly clear. And it's definitely Absolutely. not something that people have been looking at, so. Uh, Absolutely. Ricardo, may I ask a question? Oops. Yeah. yeah. Ricardo, may I ask a question? Sure, because it's the end, yeah. <laughs> no, very quickly. So I noticed, or maybe the, the, there is a tendency, a downward trend, temporal trend. So it seems like the, they're being less used. Is it because, you know, the impact of, uh, let's say, the, uh, the low-cost co low carriers model is kind of becoming more widespread, also in includes so traditional carriers? I, I would actually caution. It's not necessarily that they're becoming less used, right? If you look at the shares here, there's not necessarily a clear direction in terms of the percent of passengers using them. What's happening in, in these charts where I'm comparing here is that the difference between frequent flyer tickets and um, paid tickets is changing, right? So they're becoming more similar, which I kind of referenced at the beginning, we think might be due to just the commodification, right? I think consumers used to view these as like special things that you'd save up for a particular trip. And I think now, especially with, you know, there are lots of websites and stuff that tell you how best to use them. Consumers are more just using them as direct substitutes for cash, right? As soon as I have enough award miles to buy uh, an efficient ticket that's going to give me a reasonably good reward, I'm just going to do that as opposed to saving it for some particular trip. Okay. Thank you. Ricardo, I think you're muted. Yeah. I think. Uh... Ricardo, you don't have your, your, your mic. Sorry for that. I was saying that if there are no more questions, uh, I will give the word to our, uh, the chair of ITEA's uh, scientific committee, Leo Basso, who had some connectivity problems at the beginning of the webinar, and he joined us uh, uh, later on, but now he's here. So uh, it's my pleasure to give him the, the word to, to conclude this first uh, web webinar uh, series. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, well, it is, it's, it's good to see you, hear you, or at least feel that you're close enough, all, all of you. Um, 
Well, I, I give my excuses. Um, there was a total collapse of connectivity here. It's, it's an externality of the total lockdown we are living. Uh, everyone is trying to be connected somehow. Um, so just a few ideas that I was supposed to give at the beginning. Um, we, we decided, first of all, to cancel. I guess that, that's pretty obvious. We also decided with the executive committee not to hold uh, a virtual conference. Um, it is already hard enough for uh, people from all the world around the globe to, to be here. Uh, having a full conference dealing with time zones was impossible. So um, we decided to hold these four uh, sessions, four, four sessions of, of uh, seminars uh, during June once a week um, to try to stay connected. Um, and so we had to choose uh, 12 papers. We actually chose uh, 13. The scientific committee did the job twice because they first selected uh, 175. I mean, we received 175 papers, then we went down to 100 or 120, um, and then we had to select 13. Um, I, I know it, it is disappointing. Many of you prepared these papers. We had to make a choice based on not only on quality, but on, on coverage of topics and, and other things. Um, we do hope that uh, the next scientific committee, because uh, this scientific committee is finishing its two years term, um, in, in a rather strange way, um, it's, it's going to work well. Um, now, I, I do hope these four weeks will give us a, an efficient second best to the virtual conference. Third best, perhaps, I should say. It was, this was a good start. Um, good papers, good questions, and, and you can see that people are connected. So, so that, that's a, it's a good thing to see. And I want to, to remind you that um, the next webinar is going to be on Wednesday 10th the same time. So next week, it's on Wednesday, the 10th, yeah. 10. and not Thursday. We have staggered the date because people um, may have fixed uh, meetings. It seems that we're meeting a lot. So we did Thursday this week. We're going to do Wednesday next week, same time. Um, and, and to tease you a little, we, we're going to have um, three papers next, uh, next week. The impact of access prices on train traffic. Uh, an archaeometric study, uh, Carlos Alarte Bacares will present this. The long and winding roads, Guillermo Sinisterra, and then bike lanes, congestion, and road safety, evidence from New York City uh, with Joris Klingen. The chair is going to be Mohan Fosgerau, who is around there. So it's, you can see three different, very different subjects. Luckily, they all have to do with economic transportation. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say. Thanks. Uh, everyone, I want to thank the scientific committee for the effort. One last comment I'd like to make or to remind is that all these webinars will be recorded and uploaded to ITS webpage. Okay. And that's it. I don't know if Mark, you want to say some final words? Well, just uh, thank you, everybody. I think uh, it went uh, very well for the first uh, IT webinar. I think. Uh, it seems to me that uh, this technology will be helpful uh, not only in this period but in the future. Thank you very much and, uh, and see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye.